Hello, my name is Professor Keith Brown and I'm the chair of the Worcestershire Safeguarding Adults Board. I have many other hats. I was a professor of social work for many years and I've worked in the area of vulnerability and safeguarding. And today in this animated podcast, I want to talk to you about something called executive function. It's quite an interesting term, that isn't it? And quite difficult to always understand. Executive function is all about our ability to control ourselves, to organise ourselves and to regulate our behaviour. But at times in our lives, our executive function isn't functioning well. There can be impairments. This can be caused by alcohol or drugs. It can be caused by brain injury. But one of the biggest causes is dementia. And today I'd like to talk to you about executive function and its impairments, particularly in the context of dementia. And I'm going to do this by telling you the story of my own mother and the way I cared for her in the later part of her life. I'd like to take you back in many years, about 30 years ago, actually, when my mum and dad were in their 50s. They went on a skiing holiday and my dad was a very good skier and my mum wasn't quite such a good skier. So at the end of the day, my mother and father agreed to meet up at the top of the ski slopes and my dad and mum would come back down on the uh, chairlift together. On the descent, unfortunately, my father had a heart attack and many people were looking at this elderly one, elderly couple, a couple in their 50s, they were elderly to me at the time, uh, coming down this chairlift with a lady hanging on to this man and cuddling a man, not realising that she was hanging on to him in his last breaths of life to make sure he didn't fall out because of the the journey down, by the time my father got to the bottom, he had died. My mother was extremely lonely. One of the hardest things I've ever had to experience in my life was listening to my mother crying at night in desperate loneliness. She missed my dad so much. She was so lonely and she was so sad that she started to do things that many of us would think would be a bit crazy, a bit mad. She started having lots of boyfriends. As a son, it was very difficult coping with your mother, having different men moving in and out and all of her life going upside and down. And it was a very surreal situation. And my mother, you could argue, her executive functioning was just not functioning very well. It was not functioning very well because she was so lonely. She was in so much grief and so much pain. It wasn't dementia. But remember, executive functioning can be affected by simply grief and pain. And so technically, under the Mental Capacity Act situation, she was doing what we would describe now as making unwise decisions. Having different men come and live with her and then throwing them out because they weren't good enough. And it is and was important to allow my mother to make these unwise decisions. Even if I or others thought they were wrong, they were, after all, her decisions. Fortunately for my mum, after two or three years of this, she she met another man called Graham and they married. And my mother had a number of years in the end part of her life, happily married again for the second time. And I'm so grateful for both my mum and for Graham meeting up a second time and, and having those good years. But as time dragged on, Graham had a stroke and needed caring for, and then it became very clear that my mother was starting to have some cognitive impairment, some executive function difficulty. She was basically in the early stages of dementia. And the first time I ever really recognised this was on a visit to my mum. I used to pop round fairly frequently at this point because she was getting a little bit older. She was in the 70s, so she's not that chronologically that old but it was clear that she wasn't functioning quite so well. My mother was a very proud Northern lady, very glamorous. You'd have seen her as the belle of the ball, Um, a lovely lady. I I absolutely adored my mother and my father, but my mum was was almost my hero because so much, and you can hear it in my voice now, so much of my drive comes from my mother. And one day I visited the house and there was bags, dustbin bags of clothing lining up the hallway. Thought, what's going on here? Is is my mum having a big clear out for a charity shop? And I looked around and I could count 16 dustbin bags full of clothes 
my mum had so many clothes like most of us that she couldn't fit them all in the bedroom and some of them were stored in the spare bedroom in the spare cupboards and drawers there and I I quickly sneakily looked in the drawers and the drawers were full of vitamins and vitamin supplements and I couldn't understand every drawer I opened was full of vitamin supplements and I started chatting to my mum and I became to realize that in the space of just over a week my mother had been sold over three and a half thousand pounds worth of vitamins and vitamin supplements by a fairly well-known vitamin company over the telephone. I suspect there was enough vitamin D in my mum's house to have killed half the street. And she didn't know what to do with these vitamin supplements. And in her embarrassment, she hid them in her drawers, which had her clothes in, and was throwing her clothes away so that she could hide these vitamins. She literally didn't understand what she was doing at times when she had a high pressure salesman trying to persuade her to buy unnecessary vitamins. This is what we mean by a lack of executive function. Somebody who, to all intents and purposes, was coping quite well. If you'd have met my mother, you wouldn't have thought she had dementia. She was surviving fine. She was happy, but she couldn't stop herself. She couldn't recognize that somebody trying to sell her tons and tons of vitamins was not right. And a few weeks and months later, I had a very, very profound moment with my mother. I was walking along the high street of the little village where she lives through the shops. And my mother went to hold my hand. I don't think I've ever held my mother's hand in that way since I was a child. But when I was a child, my mother held my hand to protect me, to make sure I didn't fall into the road or get knocked over by a car or, or run off. My mother, without asking, without saying anything, literally reached out and held my hand as I walked along the high street with her. She was calling out for help. She knew that things were not quite right in her life. She knew she was not always coping, but she didn't understand. And she just needed help and support. And it was very, very profound that suddenly those parent-child relationships had reversed. And as the child, I was having to do a new level of caring for my own mother something I was very happy to do and very proud of the fact I was able to care for my mother in difficult times. But boy, oh boy, it was a shock. And I can still picture exactly where it was on that high street, a memory that will never, ever go from me for the rest of my life. My mother wanting help, calling out for help because she recognised that she wasn't always coping so well. Another example of her inability with executive functioning to manage cognitive control is this. I was in the kitchen with her one day and she got a packet of ham out of the fridge and she could still read the sell-by date. She was able to read and understand numbers and she could read a textbook to you, but she didn't understand what the numbers meant. She didn't understand anymore that a sell-by date meant that you should have eaten that ham before that date, before it went off and potentially could cause you food poisoning. If my mother had eaten that ham or done some other, in inverted commas, crazy thing, some people can be quick to draw the conclusion that that's self-neglect, that you're not looking after yourself properly, that you're not managing the life around you, the domestic issues around you. This was not self-neglect. This was not my mother not caring for herself. This was my mother not being able to care for herself because of a change in an executive function, because of her cognitive decline, because of her dementia, she could read, but not understand. And that's what happens with many of our loved ones in those journeys of dementia. They need us to hold their hands. They need us to help them make sense. They need us sometimes to help them make decisions. They don't need us to take over and do everything for them. Again, if at that time when my mother could not understand a sell-by date on a packet of ham, if you met her, if you met her outside in a social situation or in her house, you would not believe she had dementia. She was still full of life, full of energy, great communicator, a big presence in other people's presence. But 
her executive functioning was going down. A few weeks and months after that, my mother loved gardening and she was still buying plants in the garden centre and digging a garden and putting the plants out. And I stood there one day with her, again holding her hand, and she pointed out some plants to me. And she knew that these plants weren't well. They were being eaten by a green fly. They were newish plants and the green fly were thinking, yabba dabba do, here's a tasty meal. And mum pointed them out to me and she said, I, I don't know what's going on, what's going on? And you could see the green fly eating the small, new, growing leaves. What was really sad was that less than two metres away, about a metre away, in the greenhouse was the insect repellent and the bug spray from last year, visible to be seen through the glass. She couldn't connect that it was green fly that was eating her plants and that the insect repellent was just there. And all of her life in it as a gardener, she'd known how to protect plants from insects, but now she couldn't put that together. So some advice. If you've got people who you care for, but your loved ones, or people that you work with, who've got dementia, whose executive function is starting to fail, don't take over. They still have the right to make decisions that they can make. Rather, hold their hands, help them, be there. It's not easy. I used to take my son, who at this time was about 17, and towards the end of her life, to visit my mum. I was visiting four or five times a week, sometimes almost daily. And I took my son along this particular day to meet his grandma. And on the way back, I said to my son, I, I wanted to apologize for the fact that as a dad, I was spending so much time with, with grandma that I didn't have a lot of time, spare time to be with him. And as we were driving along, I, I said to my son, I I'm really sorry that I'm having to spend so much time with grandma at the moment. And he said something to me very quickly without batting an eyelid again that was very profound and very helpful to me. He turned around and he said this. He said, Dad, you wouldn't be a very good professor of social work if you couldn't care for your own mum. Indeed, you'd be a fraud. And he was so wise and so kind because he enabled me to free myself of my own guilt to spend a bit more time with my mother in the last few weeks and months of her life. It's hard. It's often extremely painful seeing your loved ones like this, seeing people that you've admired, that you've loved, that you've looked up to struggle, struggle with very, very simple tasks of daily living. But as carers and as professionals, what a joy, what a privilege. As carers and professionals, look out for unusual signs and changes in behavior. Listen and try and understand what's really going on. Often people are embarrassed, afraid, or too proud to directly ask for help. So look out for cues where people are seeking support and help, just like my mum was. Do work together with others to produce a care plan. But I also want to remind us all, we need to care for ourselves as well. It is painful, it is difficult, and therefore, make sure you care for yourself. Make sure you're not overburdened and overloaded. Find space and time to look after yourself, plus the loved one you're trying to care for. And finally, my final thoughts would be this. We live in a world where there's often great pain and great tragedy. But one of the wonderful things as human beings is kindness. And simple acts of kindness have profound impacts on people. Today, think about your own loved ones. Think about the people around you, your neighbours, people that you work with in health and social care. The smallest acts of kindness will have a profound impact on those people. So when you're facing people who are struggling with their executive function, who are often acting in ways that don't make sense, just be kind, just hold somebody's hand and be grateful that you can be a great relative, a great son, daughter, or a carer. Thank you.